Hello, I'm Stowe Tate, and I am a core faculty at the Harvard Center for Bioethics and editor of the Harvard Medical School Bioethics Journal. And I am here with James Davison Hunter and Paul Nedaleski, the authors of uh, Science and the Good. James Davison Hunter is LeBras Levinson Distinguished Professor of Religion, Culture, and Social Theory at the University of Virginia. And Paul Nedaleski is a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the book um, begins with the description um, that uh, it traces the origins and development of the centuries-long, passionate, but ultimately failed quest to discover scientific foundations of morality. Um, you begin the story with Aristotelianism and trace that through scholasticism in the Middle Ages. Um, could you say a little bit about uh, the initial motivations for what you describe as a tragic quest? So th th the beginnings of this quest happen at a particular time and place. Context is everything. And the context is uh, the late medieval world in it, um, where um, we are watching the um, erosion of the authority um, and the fragmentation of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, um, the challenges particularly that are coming from uh, Protestantism, and <clears throat> but also global exploration, um, new knowledge about the, the natural world and the globe itself, and, um, and scholasticism, kind of Aristotelian scholasticism, simply wasn't adequate to make sense of all of these changes. Um, and so on the one hand, you have increasing conflict um, in uh, Northern and Western Europe, um, largely due to, again, the rise um, and, and, and success of Protestantism um, in conflict with Catholicism and the way that that gets paired with microstates in, in Northern Europe, the way in which religion is used um, to help solidify political power and so on. But you also have, um, in addition to conflict and um, promiscuously bloody conflict, you also have the confusion that's coming from increased knowledge of the world. And the question was, how do we make sense um, of all of this knowledge and how do we find a way through our conflict? And um, clearly, Protestantism and Catholicism couldn't sort out their differences. So in a way, religion was failing, and failing in, in morally disastrous ways. What was the alternative? And um, at, at the beginning of the scientific revolution, it occurred to some, well, maybe science could become an alternative magisterium to religious faith to God um, as a source of moral authority for making sense of, of the world and all of its complexity. And then by virtue of establishing a scientific foundation of morality upon which everyone could agree, there would be a way forward. We could live at peace. There would be a foundation for human flourishing. That was the quest and it was honest, it was passionate, it mattered. Very um, optimistic. And it was very optimistic. I mean, it, you think about one third of the German population was killed in, 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 in the Thirty Years' War. Um, everyone was affected by this. There was a sense of urgency about it. So um, the context was one that really called forth um, some kind of alternative solution. And that's where the quest begins. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the new moral scientists? Sure. Uh, the New Moral Scientists are a group of thinkers from different disciplines. Some are philosophers, some are psychologists, um, some are uh, work in uh, various fields of neuroscience, but all of them are doing work that is interdisciplinary. They're drawing on from different sources, different disciplines. And uh, their perspective um, is sort of cobbled together from different views that arose throughout this three or four centuries long quest to find uh, a moral basis for, or a scientific basis for morality. Um, and so uh, 
the basic platform of views that they tend to share are uh, a sort of um, neglect of the ends in question and moral questions. And so instead they would say, what are the means, the best means to get us where we want to go? It's kind of a, a utilitarian structure where they, they don't think too much about what is the goal that we're pursuing, but instead they say, you know, what's an efficient way to get there? There's also um, what we would recognize today as a philosophical naturalism. You know, they think everything in reality has to be explainable in, in scientific terms, fundamentally. Um, they see a big role uh, for evolution. Evolution, um, naturalistic evolution explains, you know, how we got the, the suite of um, moral, cognitive, uh, you know, mental modules, if you will, that help us navigate the world. Um, and you bring all, all of this together with really in, in huge increases in techno technological uh, means for studying various aspects of the physical human, um, fMRIs. You can you know, apparently now look inside of the brain and depending on our view, inside of the mind to see what's happening when people are puzzling through moral questions. So this is kind of the view that they, they broadly share. Big names uh, from this group would be Jonathan Haidt, Joshua Green, Fiery Cushman, Patricia Churchland, Owen Flanagan, um, but it's, you know, we talk about 20 or 30 characters uh, in, our, in our story, um, but there are you know, many more who are working uh, in this world as well. Um, so that, and I think one of the big unifying uh, issues that for, the, for the new moral science, scientists is their belief that because the world fundamentally is the kind of thing that science can study, um, whatever question we're asking has to square with that. And so we, you know, we want to know about um, the phenomenon of morality in large part because of the kinds of dynamics that James described that have been with us since the beginning of modernity. Um, so obviously the best way to do that is going to be look to science to try to address that insofar as it's, it's possible. So do you think that focus prioritized problem solving versus truth or wisdom seeking? I think the answer is yes, um, because we can't seem to come to any agreement about about what is wise or what is true. Um, people are going to have different perspectives on that, and so um, problem solving is um, the kind of utilitarian turn here, um, in combination with a kind of human human moral sentimentalism, um, the evolutionary. Uh, understanding of its sources and so on, is a, a way of addressing moral issues without having address, to address the problem of truth right. Right. and how truth then can be applied wisely in the world. Well, the book covers a wide range of philosophers, uh, theologians, scientists, uh, and the moral scientists. Um, one name that didn't crop up so much was Immanuel Kant. And uh, I read Kant as basically arguing that uh, there's a limit on what we can know. You know, there's this unbreachable distance between our cognitive processes and the external world. Um, and so I take Kant as saying that we have to be sort of agnostic about that. And um, I read basically philosophy following Kant as assuming that Kant you know, had um, been atheistic about it when he hadn't at all. Um, so, do you think that um, issues such as uh, uh, Hume's challenge uh, and Kant's critique of pure reason uh, were just sort of intellectually uncomfortable moments that were bracketed and sort of set aside? Or how do you, where does Kant fit into the story here? I think it's exactly right, the, the bracketing and, and the setting aside. Um, one way that Kant comes close to the narrative we tell is it was a response to Kant's works that, you know, Hegel introduced right. some ideas that influenced, for, for example, the British idealists mm -hmm. in the late uh, 19th century, uh, Bradley Green, among others. And they, they were very interested in um, new evolutionary theories from Darwin and, and Russell and others. But there weren't very strong links between idealism and 
and evolution. It was sort of, there was a broad structural similarity. Uh, you know, the world spirit was groping toward, you know, a better, <laughs> a better state of affairs. And it seemed like there was a, at least early on, Spencer and others thought that evolution was also sort of inexorably producing uh, a better world. And so there was an attempt to, to uh, marry these ideas at that point in time. But uh, at, the, at the origins of what we would recognize as analytic philosophy today, um, there was a big cultural shift within philosophy starting in, in England and uh, idealism was largely neglected. And along with, along with idealism, a lot of Kantian views. And from the analytic side of things, which is definitely the philosophical source for the new moral scientists, um, there isn't a big emphasis on Kant's views or anything that's very anti-realist when it comes to nature. There's more of a presupposition or assumption that uh, science is telling us about the world. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's the only, only thing that's telling us about the world. So Kant was a, uh, a rationalist, but he wasn't a reductionist. And mm -hmm. part of the story is, that I think, the kind of revisionism that um, we late moderns have of some of these very important figures like Locke and Kant. Um, they, are, they are viewed in a particular way through the lens of our own, own, own context. We forget that, that Locke was, um, wrote in tomes on theism, you know, and his, um, to, to read Locke's essay con concerning education is, is uh, like reading a tract on, on, on Sunday school. Um, <laughs> Formation. I mean, it's just so it's infused with that kind of theism, and I think in the case of Kant, again, in the in the total totality of his work, um, we we see a much bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Kant is used differently today, yes. but in his context and in the context of his larger writings, he's um, actually, I think, on our side in this. I'm getting back to science. The other name that popped into my mind reading this book was Thomas Kuhn. Which is sort of a reviled figure in analytic philosophy, um, and uh, you know, taking that strain of philosophy of science, um, you know, it's it's very easy to see how Kuhn was arguing um, that we can't escape to have any objective view of things. You know, Paul Feyerabend goes even further than this, but you know, Kuhn's admonition that there's no such thing as a bare fact that we're all perspectively bound in self-referencing, self-justifying systems. Uh, um, that at, would seem to not just contradict the work that the new moral scientists are doing, but also really set out of reach objective uh, moral truths. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Do you, I mean, in the end of the book, you do, you, you're not making a, prescriptive model of morality, of course. Um, but what are, what are your th thoughts about that? I have a couple of thoughts, and James, yeah. you should uh, respond as well, if you'd like. Um, one, the new moral scientists, uh, it seems to me, uh, their motivation and their the audience that they see for themselves, um, they're operating at the level of sort of uh, public rhetoric. And there's this implicit sense that uh, I think it's pretty widely shared, um, especially, I would say, outside of the academy, that science is a good source of knowledge about reality. You know, look, look at what science has done for us. You know, science has given us flight, you know, the iPhone, <laughs> put people in outer space. Uh, philosophy, religion, what have they done for us? It's a, the history is a little more, a little more vexed. Um, and so I think they're, they're attempting to find a path through this very optimistic public perception of science toward addressing some of our, our deep moral concerns. And so I don't see much of any interaction with uh, a deeper philosophy of science. It's an interesting point that, that you raise. At the, at the level of you know, what, what should one make of this kind of Kuhnian critique, um, we don't go into that. My, just one quick thought would be that not every uh, fact you think you have in your possession um, you are confident about as every other. So there's some things you're more confident, are, you know, that this is correct than other things. And my thought would be, you have to give some kind of priority 
within your you know web of beliefs, beliefs if you will, to the things you're more sure about. And um, I think it's pretty reasonable to say that there are some some of the facts we should be more confident about would be things like you shouldn't kill people for fun. You know, they're they're, they're going to be ethical and moral moral facts. And it's difficult for me to to think that this is. Uh, just sort of emerging out of um, an anti-realist web of beliefs, it seems that there has to be some kind of connection with reality at that point. And, um, so I would push back on the sort of more radical anti-realist community of view, but we don't get into that issue much of, at all. No, we don't. And yet, um, both Paul and I would, would say that we're moral realists, and, and part of that um, comes out of a, an inductive social science look around the world it seems fairly apparent that human beings by nature are normatively inclined, that culture is normatively infused in every single way. It has a lot to do with um, language itself. Um, and yet there's all this variability. So we're fans of Kuhn at one level, but we wouldn't take the Kuhnian critique all the way down. So um, it seems to me at that point, there um, you have to begin with some understanding or vision or um, claims about the nature of, of flourishing, what constitutes human flourishing. Um, but that's something that science can't provide, but, it, 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 but the interaction of our observations, um, and not just of 18 to 22 year olds at elite universities, but around the world, tells us... An N equals nine. Or yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Tells us something um, very interesting, and I think um, maybe not fully universal, but but profound mm-hmm. about what human flourishing looks like in, um, over time and across different cultures. It may not be authoritative, but it's something we can work with. Which is interesting because that's basically what's been adopted in bioethics by mm-hmm. you know Beecham and Childress's work. They talk about a common morality. They say we don't know what it is. Yeah. We can't tell you exactly what it is, but there's some things that we can sort of all agree on. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting with the Presidential Commissions on Bioethics, yes. they couldn't agree on higher level principles, right. but they could agree about what those specifications were. They could agree right. you shouldn't kill people wantonly and that sort of thing. Right. They just couldn't agree on the reasons for why. Mm-hmm. No, Jim Childress was one of my colleagues here oh. for, for That's decades. Right. That's right. And, um, and, so where I would have, I would have agreed w- with Jim on, on, at that level, but I wouldn't have left it there. I wouldn't say that that's the end of the conversation. Because we believe that, uh, that normativity is inherently particular, right. then we can draw on the, the, the claims made by particular traditions and so on to inform what we in fact all share in common. And that enriches um, uh, our, our ethical discussions. It doesn't detract from them. So like the the move towards more narrative ethics is yes. something that's been hmm. very helpful in clinical ethics because it allows you to treat two sets of circumstances that you might think are the same differently. Right. Um, you know, based on the situation. And you know, just a brief anecdote that comes to mind. I remember a patient once who brought their child and the child had um, uh, some form of leukemia mm-hmm. and the parents just weren't interested in the various options that were available and this was a not a sure mm-hmm. cure by any mm-hmm. chance there was 40 50 percent chance maybe mm-hmm. and we couldn't understand why the parents were so reticent to explore all these different options that were available well it turned out they had had an older child who had died of that leukemia oh, right dear. and so those situations drastically inform you know how we view them and you know their moral calculus yeah, sort right. of thing. So I absolutely agree yeah. on that. Um, in the section on the quest redirected, you, you talk about a move from skepticism to nihilism. Could mm-hmm. you explain uh, what you see as, as having? Why don't you start, Paul, and sure. I'll jump in. Yeah, so the driver for this development in, in this longer quest uh, really is um, sort of a radicalization of philosophical naturalism. That's how we see it. You know, uh, naturalism as a philosophical view of the world was a frequent uh, background component of this of this narrative, right back to uh, the beginnings of the story. 
Um, but in, all, in many cases, uh, even those who would say, yeah, I think fundamentally at bottom things have to be explained in, in scientific terms, uh, in you know, terms of the properties of little, little pieces of matter or whatever, um, there was optimism or, or hope that uh, the world of our experience, the richer world of our, world of our experience, which includes, you know, apparently includes moral phenomena, um, would be able to be explained uh, in these naturalistic ways. You know, maybe someday we'll have the equation that shows us how, you know, how the value in a state of affairs can be constructed from the physics or whatever. But uh, the new moral scientists, um, which is, and, and there is another piece of a, of a larger view within philosophy, uh, have given up on that possibility and said, we now think we can just tell that there's not gonna be any sort of reduction like this. Um, morality, ethics, value, and all of the associated uh, aspects they can't really, they can't really exist. It's, they can't be a fabric of, of reality. Um, what I think is especially interesting about the new moral scientists is with two exceptions, they, they don't wanna talk about this. It'll come up in a footnote here and there, you'll hear them talk about it at a conference, but in, in their um, you know, public facing work, this is not, it's not discussed. So it's kind of this interesting uh, background view with, with I, that I think is very relevant and interesting for their, their audience to know. Um, and so they don't think, the, one, the lone exception is uh, Sam Harris. He actually is a moral realist, uh, but, but all the other characters we talk about, so far as we can tell, uh, seem to be moral nihilists. So they don't think there's any real moral phenomena. Nothing really is right or wrong. Nothing really is good or bad. But um, for whatever reason, they don't want to be upfront about that. So they still use the, the language of morality. They still talk about right and wrong, good and bad. They just redefine those terms. Um, so if you... Again, coming back to Joshua Green, if you dig into the details, he ultimately wants to cash it out in terms of satisfying certain kinds of preferences. Uh, but the, the real moral content has, has disappeared. Um, we don't doubt their sincerity, but, but, but again, think about the context. Here we are in the, in the late 20th and early 21st century is a time of great confusion and of conflict. People are looking for moral sources by, that, that can help us make sense of the world as it is and a way forward. And um, religious authority has been discredited widely in, in, uh, across traditions. Maybe science can offer something. And so you see many of the actors within the new moral science um, um, prominently in the Aspen Ideas Festival, in um, giving um, uh, TED Talks that are watched by millions and millions of people. They're selling books that are selling uh, hundreds of thousands of, of copies. They have a certain kind of moral authority by virtue of their stature in philosophy departments or in science uh, departments and so on. So they're using the language of morality from these, you know, from these platforms, but they actually don't believe that there's anything really there. To acknowledge that in public would be to undermine the whole, their whole authority and, and the kinds of, um, well, the kind of popularity that they enjoy. So it would be interesting um, to have uh, an open discussion and public discussion about that with a number of these very prominent um, figures. I, I do want to say, and I think Paul and I would agree, that that um, we don't gainsay their sincerity, we don't gainsay their, uh, their own integrity, but there is, at least implicitly, a kind of bait and switch going on. And that needs to be called out, and that's what we try to do in the book. So... It just seems anti-commonsensical to deny, uh, you know, experiences that everybody has, right? Everybody has these moral responses to things. Um, but that's essentially what you're saying that this is, is that we're all mistaken about that. That's in some, some form of emotivism or preference expression and nothing else. Right, and they, they have a lot more they, they can and do say about this. and. Um, a common move is to tie it back to uh, 
an evolutionary psychological account that that's asks the question, well, okay, if you, if you think that there really isn't any value out there, there are no real duties or obligations, then how to account for this you know, apparent experience that, of, of morality that we have? And, and the, 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 the frequent answer is, well, it, it arises from um, our Stone Age ancestors in, in hunter-gatherer environments. We, you know, and then there's sort of a, a just-so story that's told, you know, perhaps, and they're, and they're clear on this. They're, they would say these, these are theories and tentative at this point, but the thought is that it has to be something like it helped group cohesion to have certain kinds of right. moral responses. And so that was the origin. Um, they are illusory, but they perhaps... They were useful. They were useful. They, right. they kept the, the groups that had, that had those, those impulses um, around in ways that the more selfish, you know, individualistic groups uh, could, you know, didn't, didn't succeed, didn't survive. Um, but yeah, it is. It ultimately, it, on their view, it is an illusion. Um, uh, and they don't, they, they would, I think the, the response would be, well, is it really clear that people are sure that they are experiencing a moral realm? And for some people, maybe not. I mean, part of the confusion uh, in, in culture today uh, gives rise to some people who have questions about whether, well, maybe, maybe my apparent moral experience isn't, you know, heretical, isn't correct. But um, it's clear to us that for pl plenty of folks, they're... <laughs> They think they are experiencing, you know, real value, and they have real duties and that sort of thing. So it's it would be helpful for the new moral scientists to address that. Uh, uh, a former professor of mine used to say, "Philosophy is the only science to which the addition of no new facts will answer any of the questions." <laughs> you know, and I think there's a, there's some truth in that, but um, uh, it seems that there's this drive towards getting answers that um, comes across as more important than. Um, the process um, um, being correct and from from your study of the new moral scientists um, do you, do you think that they are seeing this in terms of okay if we can get from A to B then we can solve all of these problems rather than being concerned with truly understanding what's going on between A and B or do, I mean, do you think denying that there are there are these say, experiences that there's this type of mental content that we call moral deliberation reasoning is getting in the way of solving problems, and that's why we move beyond it? Or what? How does that cash out? Um, right. I think and I, the language of problem solving is that's a term that that some of the new moral scientists use themselves, and so I think I think you're onto something with, with this question. Uh, so sometimes. Um, the problem is presented as a conflict between uh, what kind of ethical position could conceivably get us all on the same page and resolve our problem problems of conflict um, versus these recalcitrant, you know, problematic moral Im impulses that that apparently everyone has. Um, this is sometimes presented as the conflict between uh, the sort of visceral, emotional, you know, Stone Age. Moral, moral impulses that give rise, according to the new moral scientist, um, as deontology, sort of these absolute prohibitions and duties that you might have, uh, as opposed to the more you know, rational or calculative um, understandings of morality uh, that you might get from some kind of utilitarianism, where, where you know, the thought would be, okay, you can abstract from your position, step back, what would really be best for everyone? And uh, something that some of the new moral scientists seem to want to say is, well, at least in principle, Everyone could accept um, a utilitarian sort of view, or that could, that could, in principle, uh, get everyone on the same page because we would have a sort of a common currency. You know, happiness. Cashing that out is going to be you know the, the real problem. But if we if we can all agree, happiness is the goal, and we should orient our our decisions toward promote promotion of happiness and move away from these merely Stone Age uh, impulses of um, you know punishment or or. Uh, duties, then that might be a path to you know, solving the problem of our conflicts. But you're right, there, uh, from our perspective, there hasn't been a lot of attention or effort given to thinking through, A, could, that, could such a program even in principle succeed? Could you really persuade any vibrant culture to abandon their sense of <laughs> um, obligations and, and duties that, that are essential to it or, or you know, deeply held? Um, and two, they, there hasn't been much of a discussion about the actual ethics themselves. Why, why should we think 
utilitarianism is correct. Uh, and I think part of that is because they, they don't think, you know, it's all an illusion. So it, it, that makes it easier to just sort of tinker and problem solve. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just echo the point and say that, that yes, the content does get in the way. And it gets in the way partly because it doesn't, it, it, those metaphysical claims made by different actors, uh, communities and individuals, they're illusory anyway. What we can agree on, at least for the most part, at least find more consensus on, or what it is the problem itself. So if the problem is real, and, it's, and, and, and we can see the consequences of this problem, let's ignore the other stuff. Focus on how do we solve the problem. Um, I call it a kind of um, um, a, a metaphysics of uh, realist anti-realism. The problem is, is real. What's behind it is uh, unreal. There's nothing it's aiming toward, but the problem is real, and we can agree on that for the most part. So let's just solve that mm -hmm. problem. And that's not just a philosophical issue. I mean, that's, that is playing out in our economy, in our politics, in our technology. The problems are real. We just have no larger framework to make sense of those problems. So let's just focus on a very practical, utilitarian... Um, just set the rest aside. That's right. Set the rest aside. That's right. Because we not, we'll never agree on that stuff. So without a deity or a metaphysics, um, it seems impossible to ground realist um, morality. Um, do you think there are gains in knowledge through science that can yield normative content? Only, only the, only the level of, um, put it this way, science isn't going to tell us the principles of morality or what the source or the, the, uh, the basic outlines of what a true ethical theory would be. And nor would it generate those. Right, and, and neither, yeah, neither will sort of arise out of the, the practice right. of science or something like that. But um, if you already have some ethical perspective that you think is correct, then you can, you know, as any other information about the world, what science tells us can be relevant. Um, if you know that life is valuable uh, and you can tell that a certain proposed uh, medicine help, you know, helps in that way, you know, saves lives, pro prolongs lives, you know, at, at least at the simplistic you know, toy example level, you can tell, oh, that's, a, that's an advance, that's a good thing. You know, we've learned something. This pill, if you take it, isn't going to kill you. It's, <laughs> it's going to help keep you alive in these circumstances. That's, that would be an instance of uh, science telling you something ethically relevant but it didn't give us that prior ethical commitment that human life is valuable. Uh, and so I think a lot of what, really everything that science can tell us that's uh, valuable for knowing what to do in an ethical sense happens at that level, not at the level of we did an experiment, speak simplistically, and this shows utilitarianism is true or something. <laughs> okay, so to push back on that a bit, if it turns out uh, mirror neurons are a thing, what kind of information, what kind of utility does that have for morality? Like, do you think that um, that's information we can use with existing beliefs we already have about morality to better inform how we act or to better inform how we explain? Um, or is that just merely descriptive? Can you say a little more about what you're... Well, like um, the idea with mirror neurons that we, in a sense, experience with others. Mm -hmm. You know, that we can immediate, we have an immediate uh, visceral uh, comprehension of another person's, say, suffering. We sort of feel it ourselves. You know, you see someone suffering, you sort of feel it yourself. And, and that some people are, are attributing to these mirror neurons that allows us to actually put ourselves in the other person's place mm -hmm. and experience that to some degree. Um, and maybe that can explain compassion, for example. Yeah, the phenomenological tradition would call that intersubjectivity. Right. And it doesn't reduce it to the kind of <clears throat> neuroscience. Um, but there is a comparable way of talking about that. And, and intersubjectivity, the language of intersubjectivity that comes out of phenomenology is rooted in shared language, shared biographies, and so on. So if, it's, if um, mirror neurons 
are understood in light of or in conjunction with a philosophical, theoretical perspective like phenomenology, I think it can help us understand. I don't think by itself mirror neurons are going to tell us that much. I, I agree with James. I want to, if I get out of something to this point, um, I think this is, could be a good example of where we would say uh, science could be very helpful at a descriptive level. So the way, the way I think we would think of it is the mirror neuron approach um, is one proposed way of understanding how we have access to uh, the, the moral experience, perhaps, of someone else, or at least their, their state, what they're feeling in a, in a given uh, circumstance. And as James pointed out, there, there's been a further question. Well, do we think these experiences um, have an implication for value? And just knowing that mirror neurons um, and the role they play in human interaction give us access to something doesn't answer that, that deeper meta-ethical question. Um, but it, it may well be that mirror neurons are the, they are the, uh, in some, some sense, physical access point we have to um, someone else's experience of the world. Because we, we know there is some connection. There is some connection between physicality and the, the ethical realm. Um, so that's... We would and not, inner we would, subjectivity. Yeah, we would, yeah. Never, we would never dispute that. So maybe the mirror neurons are a promising approach to better understand, well, how is this access had you know, in, in empathy? What, what is happening at the neural level or, yeah. So uh, in the book you discuss Rawls, um, but like Locke, Rawls also believed that people were moral actors. They had um, moral beliefs and that living a moral life was something that was sort of inherent to uh, human beings. Um, so it seems to me that if you're denying that, if that's illusory, and uh, moral science, new moral scientists are correct, then it would seem to lend itself to a sort of very undemocratic um, way of, of looking at the world. And what I mean by that is if you look at, say, Hobbes, or you look at Locke, their theories of human nature inform their theories of justice. Um, so it seems that the new moral scientists' theories of human nature but also inform their theories of justice or government or the state. Do you think that's a threat, that way of thinking? Yes. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. We're, I mean, I think the difference between, say, a, a, a Rawls and the new moral scientist is that while Rawls is a rationalist and a naturalist, he's not a reductionist. Mm -hmm. And so his, his baseline um, uh, understandings of what human beings are don't, finally uh, distill into um, the kind of reductionism that you find in the new moral science. It's a he has a richer conception of human beings that then from which he can build a larger theory of the politic, social and political order. So, um, but, it, but on the new moral science side, in large part because of, of uh, the kind of radical turn in their naturalism, it, um, you end up with a, um, a highly reductionist view of human beings, that human beings um, are uh, objects to be manipulated um, uh, rather than engaged, that their claims um, are, are, are not to be taken seriously, um, that we can safely ignore them, and that scientists themselves, partly because of their superior uh, access to uh, knowledge, information, the science itself, are in a much better position to say what is good for society, what is good for people, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a kind of um, um, deeply disturbing idea. I think, quite frankly, this is the gesture we make toward the end of the book, is that is that the new moral science provides the highest levels of intellectual rationalization for what is in fact uh, an emerging technocratic order. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's part of the, what, what's so interesting about this, and it's one of the 
central reasons why we took this project on. Um, you don't have a society without some kind of common culture. And in a world and in a society like ours that is as deeply fragmented, politically polarized as ours, on what grounds do we find some kind of common culture? Well, it's technocratic, managerial, professional, and so on. What is the idiom by which people speak through across all of these differences? Well, it's quantification, right? It's a certain kind of rationality. And so even while most people are not on the same page with the new moral scientists, the very nature of modern life and public discourse in finance, in politics, in education, we're all looking for a common language. The new moral science provides intellectual legitimations for what is already, in fact, emerging. And it's, it's deeply troubling. And I think that's, that's right. Um, and again, just to reiterate, not that any of the new moral scientists have, have any explicit ambition, but they were very bad at these things. It's, it's, our concern is sort of, as you put it, what might the consequences be for uh, a, a, moral, a moral viewpoint or an ethical perspective if your view of human nature is what theirs is. That's right. they, there's a, a fundamental incoherence, it seems to me, in the, the, the view of the new moral scientists because they have this metaphysics that doesn't permit any sort of moral or ethical basis, any sort of uh, handhold or toehold for saying, well, this is wrong, we can't go there. Um, but at the same time, as a matter of, of happenstance, they, their, you know, their, their perspective on what we should be pursuing as a society as you know, Western educated elite. If you've ever heard of you know, weird morality, that's, I can't remember what each letter of the acronym stands for, but that's, that's their perspective. But it doesn't have any final justification or basis in their, their metaphysical view. So it's, there's well, this and it seems gap. Like when thinking about like marginalized groups, there's quite a, a hubris of epistemic injustice in this, yeah, right. right? In denying, you know, what we feel, experience, know is correct, that that's all illusory. Right. And we're going to tell you what you really think. Yeah, that's right. right. I mean, that, yeah. Right. And so partly because of the vaunted platforms from which many of these people speak, mm -hmm. um, and because of the esoteric of, of science and philosophy itself, who is the ordinary person to question? Right. On what grounds are they going to take um, um, challenge the, the kinds of overreaching claims made by these individuals and by the larger discourse? So. Yeah, it's, it's a problem. So you touched on this uh, a bit, James, um, but I was curious if there was a, a tipping point that motivated this project, or is this something that's been in the works for a while, or what sort of motivated you to, to take this on? Well, I would say that the, um, uh, my work, but also the work of the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture is um, supremely interested in what we call the deep structures of culture. Think about the difference between weather and climate. Mm -hmm. Most people who are commenting on the world in politics and on technology and on, in the arts and so on, they're really talking about the weather. Uh, we're interested in, in climatological changes, the things that are not seen, that are more implicit than explicit. Uh, it's our sense that underneath the culture wars, it's un underneath the, um, all the histrionics that we see in our public culture about technology, the seemingly rapid change, or in fact, slower movements of culture. And we think that the kind of scientism that is explicitly articulated within the new moral science is actually reflecting a kind of latent functional scientism within the larger culture, and I would say within the larger culture of the dominant institutions of the emerging technocracy that we see. Um, and we think that these larger developments, both the ex explicit but, the, but especially the implicit, 
um, raise serious challenges to what many people in the world would, would consider human flourishing. As it bears on medicine, education, health policy, you name it. And if, 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 if what the new moral scientists are doing is giving an explicit expression to something that's much larger, but much more implicit, then it seems to me that we need, we shouldn't go into the future uh, naively, or to simply imagine that what the new moral scientists are doing is just this kind of hyper philosophical, hyper abstruse, that it's actually a window into deep changes in our civilization. If they are in fact pointing in the directions that we think they're pointing, then we need to understand them. And to understand them is the first step, it seems to me, in engaging them in an ethically responsible way. Well, um, James and Paul, thank you very much. It's been an illuminating discussion and it's a fascinating book. Thank you. Thank you.